It's me, Robert, with the show, Evans, Behind the Bastards. This is the podcast that this is, where we talk about the bad people. Sophie, you look <laughs> very confused. Uh, they can't all be what's cracking my pevas. You know, we're, we're not all, they're not all going to be perfect. Uh, I am Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, the show where we tell you everything you don't know about the very worst people in all of history. Uh, my guest for part two, as with part one, is Tamara Catan. Tamara, hey, how you doing, my thank man? Thank you. I'm doing great. I'm enjoying the conversation. Uh, are you ready to learn a little bit more about Roger Stone? I'm ready to learn more and ready to sleep less easy. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> is the Roger Stone guarantee. So one of the reasons I might believe the claim that Roger Stone was a major influence on Trump's mind is the fact that he and Donald Trump really do have quite a long history of working together. Despite Donald Trump's 2012 comments that Stone was a stone-cold loser, he was happy to continue to work with the man after his 1999 Reform Party candidacy failed. In 2000, while he was helping George W. Bush in Florida, Roger Stone also took time to help Donald Trump with a new pet project, a grassroots anti-gambling campaign. <laughs> it was targeted at the Mohawk Nation. The tribe had opened a casino on their land in New York State and planned to open another casino in the Catskills. At the time, Donald Trump owned three casinos in Atlantic City, the Northeast's traditional gambling hub. Clearly, the Mohawk Nation represented a threat to this earnings of Donald Trump. The ad stone designed are pretty on the edge as far as racism goes. I've got a clip of one of them here, which we'll have up on the site, BehindTheBastards.com. It says in big letters, drug dealing at Monticello, or Monticello, whatever, Thomas Jefferson's creepy house, and it's got like a picture of like a needle and lines of cocaine and like a baggie of drugs. And then it says, quote, the St. Regis Mohawk Indian tribe proposes to open a gambling casino at the Monticello Racetrack in Sullivan County. How much do you really know about the St. Regis Mohawk Indians? According to the New York Times, U.S. and Canadian law enforcement officials broke up the biggest cocaine trafficking ring in northern New York operating on the 14,000-acre St. Regis Mohawk Reservation. 26 people were arrested. Police also confiscated 19 shotguns and handguns, and it goes on like this. He's saying Indians are criminals. Yeah. That's the... And fear-mongering. The, yeah. And all, just like the border crossing where they mm -hmm. use pictures of people crossing a border in Spain. Yeah. And, said, <laughs> and just lies about women being duct taped and stuff. Now, this, this ad, which is pretty offensive, is noted on the bottom as a project of the New York Institute for Law and Society. <laughs> you ever heard of the New York Institute for Law and Society? Nope. Well, it claimed to be a grassroots organization made up of 12,000 pro-family donors who just, you know, they don't like gambling. They just didn't want any more casinos in their neighborhood. The reality is that you could probably have counted the actual number of donors using one hand. Donald Trump put up virtually all of the money, somewhere around $1.5 million. Trump signed off on the ads and the language used in them and paid the bills for the private eyes Stone hired to surveil the tribe. The whole operation was Roger's plan. Because this organization violated New York laws on lobbying, because you're not allowed to pretend that something has a bunch of funders when it's just one guy yeah. who's doing it so that his own casinos don't have competition. You're not supposed to do that. So the state investigated. They wound up sitting down with Roger Stone and interviewing him. Here's the LA Times. Quote, Stone told state investigators that he thought the public might pay attention to a pro-family group, but not to Trump, a loud and longtime critic of Native American gambling who was trying to stave off competition for his three casinos in Atlantic City. You could hide Trump's actions from the public, the investigators grilled Stone, and you did that over and over again? Yes, Stone answered each time, finally adding, nothing is wrong with that, by the way. There actually was something wrong with that. Trump and Stone were fined $250,000 for breaking the law and required to pay more than $30,000 to run statements in Albany area newspapers. Just nothing for them. Yeah, which is nothing for them. Yeah. This is the, the text of the statement. Donald Trump, Roger Stone, and Thomas Hunter apologize if anyone was misled concerning the production and funding of the lobbying effort. They did not apologize for the ad's content. Now, over the next 15 years, there were dozens and probably hundreds of other stories like that. Roger Stone developed a special hatred for Elliot Spitzer, Attorney General of New York from oh, yeah. 1999 to 2006, and then Governor of the state in 2007. Now, Elliot was born rich, like a shocking number of U.S. politicians, and his father had pumped millions of dollars into his career back in the mid-90s. Right around the time Elliot was elected governor, he threatened to release records about Republican Senate Majority Leader Joe Bruno. There was basically like a rumor that Bruno had been using state aircraft 
left to aid in his reelection campaign, and Spitzer was going to like release records that would prove that or not. And I think Bruno was eventually found not guilty of that. I'm not sure, but he was also later found taking a bribe and then got off on like a technicality, but totally received like four hundred thousand dollars from some guy. Anyway, so so Joe Bruno, Republican Senate Majority Leader of New York, did not like Elliot Spitzer. These guys were at each other's throats, and in order to get back at his political enemy and to distract from his own corruption charges, Joe Bruno called up Roger Stone and offered him $20,000 a month to end Elliot Spitzer's career. Wow. Roger gleefully dove into this effort to destroy another person. One June morning in 2007, Elliot's 83-year-old father, Bernard, who suffered from Parkinson's, woke up to find this message on his answering machine. This is a message for Bernard Spitzer. You will be subpoenaed to testify before the Senate Committee on Investigations on your shady campaign loans. You will be compelled by the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms. If you resist the subpoena, you will be arrested and brought to Albany. And there's not a goddamn thing your phony, psycho, piece-of-shit son can do about it. Bernie, your phony loans are about to catch up with you. You will be forced to tell the truth. And the fact that your son's a pathological liar will be known to all. So, uh, wow. yeah, uh, by the way, that is when I quoted in the first episode Donald Trump calling him a loser and saying he's a, a liar and everything. That's why. Because actually Donald Trump liked Elliot Spitzer's dad and yeah. was like, actually, like, he, Donald Trump was morally offended by this message. Unbelievable. Which is, that's I mean, a hard line to hit. It, it's <laughs> pretty gnarly to go to an 83-year-old man. Yeah, an ill 83-year-old an Ill man, man who is the father of the guy you don't like. God. And attack him that way. Who you got paid to not, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, he didn't like him, but it, it's like his job. You're getting paid to destroy his son, not his dad. Like, how does that help you deal with Elliot it's Spitzer? So gross. He's just a gross person. Yeah. Now, Roger claims that that's not him. <laughs> well, we're going to dig into that a lot here. That's as much him uh, as his suits are him. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a pinstripe voice. I, I will let you know. Um, we'll, we'll put in a link to that particular audio clip on the site. It it, it includes wow. after the uh, the voicemail several clips of just Roger talking, so sure. you can hear for yourself. That's fucking Roger it's Stone. It's so him. But yeah. like Bernard Spitzer hired a PI who traced the call back to Roger's apartment and stuff. Like it's it's definitely Roger yeah. Stone, unless you're Roger Stone. Now Roger has always denied making that call. He has, in some recent interviews, coyly said, it does sound a lot like me. Mm. But he blamed it at the time on former stand-up comedian and radio host Randy Credico. Now, we're going to be talking about Randy Credico a little bit later today, too. I remember too. that name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Randy Credico was like a comedian. He was on like Leno sometimes. He did like improv. And he, Stone was basically like, he's so good at doing fake voices. He pretended mm. to be this guy and this guy. It's clearly him pretending to be me. And Credico was like... I haven't even talked to Roger in years. Why would I do this? Yeah, <laughs> like, which and why would you do something so mean and evil? Like, yeah, a, a comic. It would be one thing to be like, it's yeah, not funny. <laughs> maybe this comedian called up the governor of New York to leave him a shitty message as someone else. Okay, I can imagine that happening. Like sure. Opie and Anthony did shit, but his dad. Yeah, <laughs> like why? And there and there was no. There's no value joke. in it at all. It's just cruelty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Stone and Credico had met back in 2003, and Randy had introduced Roger to Al Sharpton. Sharpton had hired Stone to help with his 2004 presidential run, probably in the hope that Sharpton's campaign would take votes away from John Kerry. Roger would later tell the Washington Post, quote, Credico became convinced that he should get paid for introducing me to Sharpton. He refused to do so. Stone continues because, well, Credico is a cocaine addict, and Stone knew that any money he gave to the guy would go, quote, up his nose. So Roger Stone leaves this really gross message. It's obviously him. He blames it on a friend of his that he hasn't talked to in years and also says the guy's a coke addict. Unbelievable. Now, yeah. this may sound a little bit familiar to of course, Roger. Trump. Well, and, but also Roger Stone when... It came out that he'd been putting up sex ads in yeah. these magazines. He's like, no, it was my housekeeper. Yeah. Like, and Trump throwing his own yeah. his own son-in-law under the bus. No That's one's the, sacred. No to one is safe. Yeah. It's a gross way to live. It really is. And the only way you can live that way is if you have more money than God. You know what kills me is all my life I've grown up watching these Hollywood films, and I always, just a sense of justice is what kept me happy. Yeah. Believing in things like karma, believing that things come around. This is a movie where the bad guy win is winning so far. 
And I'm like, why is this movie so long? Why, why is this movie when, my entire life? Yeah, when's he going to get it, man? <laughs> like, have you ever seen a guy in the middle of a horror movie yeah. who's such a jerk? You're like, I can't wait till he dies because I know it's going to be something horrific. The Paul Manafort story has been that yeah. for me because just like seeing him denied to wear a suit recently yeah. and like ill and clearly not healthy and just like, yeah, die in prison, Paul. I don't yeah. know. I'm violently angry about Paul Manafort. I spent yeah. time in Ukraine. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, and I saw a lot, like, Roger Stone's a piece of shit, but, like, maybe this makes the episode weaker, but no one will ever match the hate that we do on the show that I have for Paul Manafort. Yeah. Uh, just, well, it's deserved. I, yeah. mean, I mean, look how many millions. He's literally responsible for millions hundreds of and deaths. millions of th- uh, yeah. deaths. Yeah, I mean, millions of deaths, I mean, a probably. civil war yeah. going for a decade longer than a... Uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, conservatively five or 600,000 deaths in that conflict alone. And for he, money. Yeah, for money. For Money for... he didn't need. He had all the money he needed, he, he needed already. I could Sorry. talk shit about Sorry. Paul. No, no, no. I mean, I, I get I get really worked up when we talk about Manafort. But it's also worth noting that like, there's almost a way you could say Roger Stone is even grosser because at least Paul yeah. Manafort was getting involved, was in the trenches dealing with those people. Yeah. Roger Stone was just cashing their checks. Yeah. <laughs> just like, yeah, I don't give a shit where this money comes yeah. from. It's so, so bizarre. So you could say that's grosser. Yeah. You could say that's grosser. Maybe it is. Now, Randy Credico is going to come back into the story a little bit later. But uh, what's important right now is that uh, Bruno fired Stone after this voicemail came out, you know. But Elliot Spitzer wound up going down anyway. It's kind of debatable as to whether or not it was Roger's dirty tricks that were responsible of it. There was a, a federal wiretap in a New York Times report about him that revealed he'd been spending tens of thousands of dollars on high-priced prostitutes. And his big thing was, like, he sleeps with prostitutes while wearing his socks. That's Roger Stone. That was Roger That's Stone. That's a Stone detail. Uh-huh. Roger Stone repeated that detail to every newspaper in the goddamn world it's for so months. It's so petty. It's very petty. But he, it shows very that stone. he has a really uh, subtle understanding of how humanity works. Yeah. That it's something that, like, even if I was that sort of a person, I wouldn't think that that detail would matter. He knew that it totally did. Yeah. And we don't even know. I mean, maybe he made that detail up. Maybe um, yeah. he just knew, oh, that's something that'll stick yeah. in their heads. But um, I could also see that one being true because Elliot Spitzer undoubtedly was hanging out with a lot of prostitutes. Sure. Um, which I wouldn't have an issue with if he hadn't been an attorney general and thus responsible for prosecuting prostitution in the exactly. state of New York. Um, but it's debatable. You'll hear people say that Stone dropped the dime on Spitzer to the FBI. And that's why there was the investigation, and that's why everything came out that he did mm. bust Spitzer this way. I haven't found hard proof of that. Uh, there was definitely a federal wiretap and a New York Times report about him. It's entirely possible that Roger Stone, that his main contribution was dropping that story about the socks, and yeah. that like he just sort of was like, oh, this is a happy accident. I really don't know. Yeah. But it seems pretty likely that he had a significant role in Spitzer's political downfall. It, that that yeah. does seem likely. For sure. Um, all the tales of Roger Stone's crapulence over the years prompted The New Yorker to write a profile of him in 2008. I think that article is the first place, at least the first major outlet, where Roger started talking about what he called Stone's Rules. Oh. <laughs> These include such chunks of political wisdom as, he who speaks first loses. Attack, attack, attack. Never defend. Admit nothing. Deny everything. Launch counterattack. And when I hear the word culture, I reach for my revolver. Wow. So. There was another one that... There's a lot. I, of them. I don't know. There, there's an the endless number of them. The one that makes my skin crawl is that hate is a greater motivator than love, mm. and that's the one that makes my skin crawl because that is the Trump campaign. Yeah, and every campaign he's been involved. I with. mean, that's fascism, man. Yeah. Like that's the core ideological. Not that I don't think Donald Trump is an ideological anything. Yeah, but that is the core of that political philosophy. Is yeah. that hate and fear are a hell of a lot more powerful than love? Yeah. Although Hitler would have said, no, it's the love of the Volk or whatever that is the, I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with dead Hitler here. <laughs> um, reasonable men and Hitler can disagree. I'll uh, let you win. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you win against, yeah. um, against dead Hitler. <laughs> against dead Hitler. We all win against dead Hitler. We do. He's so, dead. We're still here. We're in your still face here. with your stupid mustache. Suck on that, Hitler. Yeah, with your baby mustache, you freak. Stupid mustache. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I tr- Part of me wonders like, if Hitler hadn't ever been Hitler. Mm-hmm. Would that mustache be around? Would like we all have a friend with? A I think Hitler it would be mustache? back in East Hollywood for sure. I feel like people dip their toes with the Hitler Youth haircuts. Yeah. They dip their toes. I mean, I, <laughs> that, that shaved on the sides look is nice. Yeah, it can it can work. It looks nice. It's it a work. nice comeback. But yeah, it's baby mustache it's, adjacent. It's baby mustache adjacent. <laughs> I don't know. It's one of those things where like. 
at the time it was like this is we're way off topic, but that was considered like a working man's mustache sure. because you don't have to groom it or anything. That makes right? sense. It's an honest man's mustache, and so yeah. that's kind of like what Hitler was repping to everyone. Is yeah. like oh, I'm just a normal working Joe like you. Yeah. See, I think that's the thing that he sees. The way like a great athlete or a great chef or a great artist can see things that normal people can't see. I think he sees these subtleties. He sees like a naked man wearing socks and goes, that's not presidential. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That does, that's, that's ridiculous. Silly. That can hurt him. No one well, will take him seriously exactly. having this in their mind. Or I should shave my mustache so they look at me and say, I'm one of them. Like he's got that kind of eye. And if we're looking at what, is there some aspect of what I, I have? I, part of me believes that anyone as prominent as someone like Roger Stone has become, there is an aspect of genius at play. I just, agree. just like there is with you have to. Alex Jones. Yeah, you, know? you you have to. Otherwise, they become too powerful. Yeah, you you have to allow yourself to have a level of respect so you can figure out how to deconstruct them. And I think you've. I didn't really figure it out when I was writing this, but I think you've nailed what it is that his genius is. Is recognizing those. It's not the actual tricks he plays. It's knowing how to present things in a way that leave an indelible. Yeah image in people's heads yeah and i think the spitzer thing like really focusing on those socks that he's wearing while he's fucking these call girls i think that nails it i think that's yeah. like what he's good at yeah i yeah. agree yeah and we'll that we'll actually be talking about some more stuff like that a little bit later yeah. uh so yeah roger stone starts in like the early 2000s talking about stone's rules all the mm. time every interview he does he'll drop the rules you know this is my rule here this is my rule here this is my trying to brand himself mm. here's a quote from the new yorker his outfit comported with two of the rules in his book, Stone's Rules for War, Politics, Food, Fashion, and Living, which he hopes to publish soon. Never wear a double-breasted suit and a button-down collar and white... I just love the idea that it's, it's like such a Michael Scott thing to do is yeah. have the name of a book that you haven't written that you talk yeah. to an interviewer about. 100%. It's amazing. It's so great. <laughs> yeah. Michael Scarn. <laughs> it's, that, that was just like... I Because th- I started looking up that book and I was like, oh, he hadn't written that when this came out. He yeah. was just trying to make it a thing. I I am proud to say on behalf of Roger that he did eventually write kind of that book. It wasn't the same title, but you can buy it, you know, Stone's Rules, How to Win at Politics, Business, and Style from the InfoWars store right now. Unbelievable. Yeah. It currently has 12 reviews, so wow, you could really be on the ground, very low, low. ground floor. This is the copy. Or the, the front, and he's covering his weird bird lips. Yeah, he's covering his weird bird lips. He's got like his, <laughs> he's got like his hand at his, at his lips or something. Yeah, he's, he really, I think he's trying to cover those jowls or something. It's an interesting yeah. choice that he would cover up half his face. Such an arrogant man. It shows you he's simultaneously arrogant and insecure. Nobody who's that obsessed with fashion can be secure in their person. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Nobody who fucking worries about what their suspenders are called is yeah. secure in their physical form. Yeah. He's, he's the opposite of the cat that stares in the mirror that sees a lion. Yeah. He's a lion that stares in a mirror and sees a cat. A little Ooh. baby kitten. Ooh. He's so weak. Yeah. That's what all this peacocking is. Like, like uh, an old lady that used to be really sexy and, and wears a miniskirt. And you're like, that's not you. This guy's 66 and he still calls himself a quote unquote tough guy. Well, and it's like he also needs to be attached to some bigger man. He yeah. Doesn't, he doesn't do anything on his own. Because he's, he's the kitten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whether or not it's Alex Jones or Donald Trump, he's yeah. always attached to somebody exactly. else. Exactly. He's, a... he's the sidekick. Yeah, he's kind of like a chronic sleazy sidekick of right-wing firebrands. Exactly. It's weird. Like if Darth Vader had a talk show, he'd be evil Ed McMahon. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's about right, yeah. <laughs> now, that 2008 New Yorker interview also revealed that Roger Stone had, in 2007, gotten a photo-accurate back tattoo of the head of his hero, Richard Nixon. <laughs> The article also noted that Stone tans 12 months a year and drinks four triple espressos every day. Stone talked about his recent move to Miami, saying, it's a sunny place for shady people. Oof, what right a quote. In. Yeah, that's a good quote. Wow. He, some, he, the man could turn a phrase every now he and really then. He really can. That was, he, that's he, a good one. It is a good one. Yeah. And you know, he was an actor for a while in high school. No, I, I didn't even run across yeah, that. Yeah, he's an, he was an actor for a short time in high school. And when he got into politics, he, he said this. He said, I then realized that acting and politics were the same. Oh. I feel like a lot of people have had that experience. Now more than ever with the transparency the internet's creating. I mean, fucking Ronald Reagan. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah. Rode bedtime for Bonzo right to the Oval Office. Let's just make it stop before The Rock. (laughs) That's all I want. (laughs) You know what? Again, not the worst case scenario anymore. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I've had enough, Robert. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) 
Uh, Can you smell what the president is cooking? I, mean, I can't take that. Wouldn't it be soothing <laughs> to just have a nice person in there? Yeah, I mean, maybe the, the I'm sure the climate will continue its unheated acceleration into insustainable, like like a greenhouse nightmare. Yeah. But at least the president could be friendly. Hey, you're right. I, I just I think that should be the the minimum requirement. We should have someone whose character is at a level that we just go, okay, this is a decent human being yeah. who is at least trying for the good of the country, like Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And actually, like no one else, but like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> like, whereas, well, at least he's a nice person. You're Not right. a great president, but <laughs> well. <laughs> okay, so we are going to uh, continue talking about Roger Stone and get into his uh, uh, downfall. I think it's fair to say downfall. Now, I agree, 100%. which is going to be the most satisfying, cathartic part of this podcast. Amen. But first, you know what's even more cathartic than the Let's, downfall of a monster? Tell me, I was just thinking about catharsis. Wonderful services and products that are provided by the advertisements in front of uh, products. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Uh, listeners, while those wonderful ads that you were spending your money on were running, we <laughs> started to suspect that Roger Stone's greatest crime may in fact have been appropriating the phrase, it's a sunny place for shady people from someone else. We yeah. found a sunglasses line in a book, although the book came out after that interview did. So it's hard to yeah. say. Roger may have stolen that line from someone. Yeah. Sophie's going to do that research, and we'll we'll get back to you. Uh, or not. If nothing interesting comes up, we won't get back to you and pretend this didn't happen. <laughs> anyway, so in 2008, while he was doing that interview, uh, it was not a great time to be a Republican in politics. You know, Barack yeah. Obama had just kind of bum rushed the McCain campaign. You yeah. know, it, it didn't look like uh, the Republicans were going to be back in power for a little while. A black man um, beat a white war hero. Beat a white war hero uh, and whatever Sarah Palin is. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was looking like a rough time for a Republican political operative. Sure. And so in that interview, Roger Stone noted, quote, the left has done a better job of dominating the new space. We're weak on the web. Mm. So a little foreshadowing there. Yeah. Questioned about the McCain campaign, Roger Stone advised, quote, an Exonian slash and burn campaign against Barack Obama. Obama and his wife are elitists and they're weak. They don't share middle class values. Middle class Americans are proud of their country and they are not. He thinks he's going to sit down with Iran and Hamas. How do you know he's not going to shake hands with a suicide bomber? You can't sit down with people who don't want to sit down. All he's going to do is raise taxes, which is going to give the government more money, but it's not going to create any jobs. Remember, Stone said, Politics is not about uniting people. It's about dividing people and getting your 51%. Oof. Wow. That's wow. Roger Stone and Paul Manafort in motherfucking nutshell. You know what? It might be his own thirst for attention, the attention he never got from his dad that's mm -hmm. going to be his downfall. Mm -hmm. Because he's He can't not speak to the press. He's underestimating people. Yeah. He, even though he, he said, he said this plenty of times that his target audience is not the elite, that is not the sophisticated, it's not people who, who study or read up on politics. But now he's underestimating their ability to read things about him and for them to still be hypnotized. So here, he, kind of spinning off of that, I'm not sure if it's him underestimating them or if it's a fundamental, he can't understand politics is not about politics to him. It's about the same thing a game of Monopoly is. Yeah, when you get into a, right. really into a game of Monopoly. Yeah. And so he is incapable of realizing like, no, Roger, the things that you are doing have a, are impacting people's lives in horrible negative ways. When yeah. you get these politicians and they, they put in these these short-sighted policies that fuck up and you know lead to all the terrible things that these different politicians you've supported over the years have done. Like when these things impact people's lives, they get angry. And then they hear you talking about like dividing people. And they're like, I can't talk to half my family. We're all screaming at each other. Yeah. And like, you, you can't understand what it's like to be in that situation because none of this means that to you. Yeah. Um, so we're the United States of America. And to hear yeah. like a, a, a campaign manager or a political strategist for the president of the United States of America, that his tactic was to divide yeah. a country whose foundation was about uniting. Yeah. It's just so heartbreaking. Well, and it's one of those things you couldn't until recently get away with. Like you remember when uh, Barack Obama was running and he made that comment about people clinging to their guns and their Bibles. Yeah. That was a huge 
uh, I was still very much in the right wing media bubble at that point in time in my life, and that was a huge issue. Like yeah. People being like, and he and there were, there's good reason to be pissed about that. If you're sure. if you're a Bible believing Christian, if you're someone who grew up shooting and has done that your whole life and live in a place where like, yeah, that's an offensive thing it's to a hear. Stereotype. And he yeah. had he had to address that shit. Yeah. And any presidential candidate up until 2016 would have had to face consequences for a statement like that. A guy like Roger Stone has never had to because he's not. A candidate ever, yeah. and no, it's almost never transparent who he's advising, and so he's never had to be that careful. Yeah. Which I think we're getting to the part of the story where that bites him in the ass. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's worth noting before we move on from the 2008 that during that election he formed the group Citizens United, not Timid, to oppose Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Mm. Literal acronym, CUNT. Cunt. Yeah. Oh, nice guy, Roger. Now, in 2010, two years into Elliot Spitzer's political exile, Roger Stone struck again. After being laid off, he'd apparently found another set of backers, wealthy Republicans, his description, who paid him to make sure Spitzer's political career stayed dead. And this is where, you know, after Spitzer was already out, this is where he started talking about the Sox. Like, this is where he started spreading that myth. And he claims that he was, like, at an adult club and met a girl who was friends with a girl who'd worked with Spitzer, and she told him the story. (laughs) It's unbelievable. It's like, I was talking to my prostitute Uh, friend. And she said, this is how silly this is. And she says it two years after Spitzer's out as governor because he's already been disgraced. Yeah. Yeah. So Unbelievable. Yeah, anyway, Roger Stone seems to have grown less cautious and careful in his golden years. Maybe it's the corrupting influence of social media, but over the last decade, he's racked up a pretty horrifying compilation of sexist remarks. Here's Media Matters. Stone tweeted that New York Times columnist Gail Collins is an elitist cunt. MSNBC host Rachel Maddow is Rachel the Muff Diver. Fox News' Megyn Kelly has a nice set of cans. And Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz is a JAP, acronym for Jewish American Princess. He thought that was going to be one kind of racist, but it was another. Who is every man's first wife. He also tweeted, die bitch, at former New York Times executive editor Jill Abramson and said he would kill himself if he was married to screechy and shill Carly Fiorina. The Sun Sentinel also reported that Stone called Florida politician Barbara Stern a self-important nasty cunt on Twitter. So, lest I leave the impression that Roger's bigotry is limited to women, here's a bunch of racist stuff he said. Stone's tweets include attacks like stupid Negro, fat Negro, arrogant know-it-all Negro, Uncle Tom, Mandingo, and House Negro. Stone tweeted that commenter Roland Martin is a stupid Negro and a fat Negro, commentator Herman Cain is a Mandingo, and former Representative Alan West is an arrogant know-it-all Negro. He also tweeted that commentator Al Sharpton is a professional Negro who likes fried chicken, asked if former Republican presidential candidate Ben Carson was an Uncle Tom, and referred to himself as an N-word with a Nixon tattoo. He did not use the phrase N-word. That was an uncomfortable paragraph to state, but this is all stuff Roger Stone said, mostly about Republicans. Like, Crazy. He's just... No they filter. Re- they rejected him. Yeah. They rejected the him. The mainstream ones he, did. Yeah, mainstream Republicans rejected him, and he's attacking. He's, yeah. hurt. he's a hurt man. Yeah, he's a, he's a hurt man. And uh, in 2014, he got his chance to uh, push some pain back out into the world. That is the year when Donald Trump began to execute his campaign run for president. Now, Roger Stone was reportedly Donald Trump's number one consultant for the early stages of his bid. According to Joshua Green, the author of Devil's Bargain, a book about the election, quote, Inside Trump's circle, the power of illegal immigration to manipulate popular sentiment was readily apparent, and his advisors brainstormed methods for keeping their attention-addled boss on message. They needed a trick, a mnemonic device. In the summer of 2014, they found one that clicked. According to Sam Nunberg, who worked with Trump during this period, Roger Stone and I came up with the idea of the wall, and we talked to Steve Bannon about it. It was to make sure Trump talked about immigration. Initially, Trump seemed indifferent to the idea, but in January 2015, he tried it out at the Iowa Freedom Summit, a presidential cattle call put on by David Bossie's group, Citizens United. One of his pledges was, I will build a wall, and the place just went nuts. Wow. That's what you're talking about. It's like with the socks. Roger knows... That's something that'll stick in people's heads. Exactly. You got to drive that. And I think that is his major contribution to 100%. the Trump campaign. 100%. That's why even when he's fired, people keep him. So Roger Stone stole his catchphrase about Florida from a, a 1941 novel. Oh, M. Somerset Maughan. Yeah. Or Maughan. I don't know how to pronounce yeah. it, but I've seen that name before. Wow. <sighs> Yet of another course. crime uncovered. <laughs> you shady son of a bitch. He's so... Uh... Hey, and you know what's funny too? This is almost like when you go to jail and you don't want anybody to mess with you, so you just 
throw human poop on you. Yeah. And everyone's scared to touch you. I think he plays so dirty and so gross that people are like, I know he's doing something illegal, but I don't want to fight with him because he fights like a homeless person. Yeah. He's going to bite and scratch and stab. And she, he's, it's, it's so bizarre how broken this guy, I didn't think during this conversation, I would actually feel sorry for this guy, but that's what I do. There's feel. a deep core of sadness to yeah. it. Yeah. 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 It becomes clear the more you dig into like what he's done his whole life. I now, think that's the justice. Is yeah. he, he wants us to think he's strong, even calls himself a bodybuilder and, yeah. and tattoos a man's face on his back that he thinks is strong. And really, he's just this insecure, weak, broken little, broken man. little boy. Yeah. Yeah. They all are at some yeah. level. Yeah. Now, uh, Stone's time with the Trump campaign did not last all that long. In August of 2015, after a performance in one of the Republican primary debates that was wrongly considered to be disastrous for the Trump campaign, you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Roger quit or was fired. Roger claims he quit, at least. Trump says that he fired Roger and Roger says that he quit and basically fired Trump from anyway. It's... Who knows? They each thought uh, he was getting too much airtime for Trump's taste. But wasn't that the hypothesis? That might be part of it. And it might also be that after that, Roger also thought that things were going badly with the campaign and didn't want yeah. to like be attached to it anymore. Because it looked bad back then for Trump. Yeah. Nobody was guessing. Uh, yeah, Republicans were yeah. screaming, get Trump out. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of people were angry. So that may have been why that happened. He was trying to like, anyway, yeah. this was not the end of the Stone-Trump relationship, though. Uh, according to one version of events, at least, Roger Stone was responsible for hooking Donald Trump up with Paul Manafort, who at that point lived in a Trump Tower but did not actually know Donald well. Some people say that Stone is the guy who pushed Manafort on Trump, basically in order to give himself an in with the campaign that he'd probably been fired from. If true, this would be an appropriate reversal of Roger's agreement to act as Manafort's proxy in the Young Republicans so many years before. A nice little bit of symmetry. Yeah. And it would be nice if the only person either of them is capable of doing a single altruistic thing for is the other. If like the one nice thing Paul Manafort ever did was for Roger Stone and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> it's funny. You know, I think when Manafort got hired, I think in the documentary it was uh Stone who quoted he, he his quote when Manafort got hired was back in the saddle again. Yeah. Like I'm back. He knew that was his way back into the campaign. Yeah. And it does seem like, and we'll see how things go now, but it seems like for a while, the two were pretty good at being solid with each other. You know, yeah. they backstab a lot of other people, but they were usually on the same side of things Yeah, um, when they were both involved in the same thing. Some of that may be that Manafort was really more overseas, you know, after like the 80s sure. particularly. But. It's like an episode of Survivor, but in D.C., yeah, I mean, that's, kind of, that's kind of the Let's beltway. Let's form a union yeah. and then attack everybody else. Yeah, it's just Roger Stone and Paul Manafort against the world. The only smart mm. member of that group in the long term turned out to be Black, who has just got rich and d- decided and not to commit more crimes. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, boy. Now, most of what we are going to talk about from here on out, Roger Stone's relationship with WikiLeaks and the Mm. possibly criminal behavior he engaged in on behalf of the Trump campaign, all of this is very controversial. We don't know exactly what happened yet because obviously the Mueller report's not out. There are competing versions of events and competing suspicions of how things went down. One thing that is crystal clear about this time is that Roger Stone was instrumental in bringing Alex Jones and Donald Trump together, which... Again, that's why I brought up the stuff about conspiracies earlier. He's always had that thing. And starting in about 2013, he and Alex Jones start being buddies. Mm-hmm. And he eventually becomes like he's an InfoWars employee for like the last three years. Wow. So he's he's like hosting a show. He's a reporter there. He's making probably 20, 25 grand a month. And I do want to, uh, I want to plug quickly here. Knowledge Fight, the podcast that talks about Alex Jones shows, just did a fantastic episode on all of this. Yeah, if you go to Knowledge Fight's website at Knowledge Fight, or just look them up on on Google, Knowledge Fight. The January 25th, 2019 episode. They go into a lot more granular detail about this than we're going to because we're kind of covering his whole life. They focus more on his shadiness with WikiLeaks. It's great. I really recommend it. But yeah, so it's unclear when uh, exactly Alex and Roger became friends, but it's very clear that Roger was the reason that Donald Trump sort of got keyed into the fact that InfoWars existed at all. Because yeah. I, I don't think Donald Trump was listening to a lot of InfoWars in the 90s or whenever. Yeah. Now, in December of 2015, Donald Trump showed up on InfoWars and praised Alex Jones as having an amazing reputation. As the 2016 election picked up steam, Stone became a more 
frequent guest on InfoWars. On August 4th, 2016, he showed up as a guest on the InfoWars radio show. At this point, Alex Jones was telling his listeners that Hillary Clinton was about to resign as a presidential candidate under the shame of a massive criminal indictment. Now, at this point, a number of hacked DNC emails had already been released via WikiLeaks. Stone claimed on air on August 4th to know about the upcoming release of more hacked DNC emails on WikiLeaks. He also claimed to have spoken with Donald Trump on August 3rd. More recent releases as part of the Mueller investigation have shown that on the 4th, the same same day Stone was on InfoWars, he emailed Trump advisor Sam Nunberg and told him he'd had dinner with Julian Assange the night before, which, if you're keeping track, would be the same day he claimed to have met with Trump. Oh, yeah. So, when we talk about evidence of collusion, there is some. Definitely. Speaking of collusion, this podcast colludes with a number of fantastic sponsors <laughs> uh, that help keep the lights yes. on and uh, allow us to do this show. So please collude with us Beautiful. in bringing you this information <laughs> by colluding with capitalism to purchase products. All right, we're back and uh, we are talking about Roger Stone in the 2016 election. Now, over the course of 2016, Roger Stone repeatedly played the role of hype man for WikiLeaks' release of uh, Democratic campaign documents, as well as Clinton advisor John Podesta's emails. On August 21st, he tweeted, Trust me, it will soon be time in the barrel, hashtag crooked Hillary. Shortly thereafter, WikiLeaks published a cache of John Podesta's leaked emails. Roger frequently spoke on InfoWars and wrote articles on Breitbart, poo-pooing the idea that Russia had anything to do with all these hacks and pushing the narrative that Guccifer 2.0, the person behind the DNC hacks, was an independent activist, a hero in Stone's telling, and not an agent of the Russian government. Now, on election night, 2016, Roger Stone celebrated with his good buddy, Alex Jones. The two drank champagne and saluted the dawn of a brave new era. But for Roger, and probably for Alex too, the end of the fun times was finally nigh. Donald Trump's upset victory got a lot of people to start looking much more closely on whether or not there had been any collusion with WikiLeaks or the Russian government within the Trump campaign. It quickly became apparent that Guccifer 2.0 was, in fact, a Russian operative. He fucked up and gave investigators the digital equivalent of DNA evidence that he was a spy. And, of course, later leaked chat logs revealed that Roger Stone had been communicating with him. Same thing happened with WikiLeaks. It's, again, still a little bit unclear exactly how all of this maps out. Out. It, it seems like what happened is Roger Stone was communicating with a guy named Jerome Corsi, who was one of the major origin points for like the birther bullshit myth thing and who also yeah. had connections with uh, WikiLeaks. And that was his go-between and he was sort of working directly with WikiLeaks that way. And he definitely – there's also been reports that he was sort of selling himself to the Trump campaign since he'd been kicked out as an advisor as a liaison to WikiLeaks and was coordinating with the campaign probably with Steve Bannon. Yeah, That's what it looks like was happening, although yeah. again, it's not exactly known. So it looks like, yeah, Roger Stone was working directly with Jerome Corsi as well as communicating with WikiLeaks one-on-one -on -one and communicating with uh, Guccifer 2.0 in order to sort of coordinate the release of leaked documents with, you know, the, the, the presidential campaign to hurt Hillary Clinton. Now, when all of this became the biggest news story in the country, which it's been for more or less the last two years, yeah. Roger suddenly started claiming that he had not, in fact, had direct contact with WikiLeaks or Assange, which, of course, multiple times during the election he had talked about on like sure. radio shows and podcasts, yeah. talking with WikiLeaks and stuff. But he, he had not been consistent about this, but he suddenly started lying once the Mueller investigation kicked up uh, and began claiming that rather than talking directly with WikiLeaks or communicating and like colluding like through with Jerome Corsi. His contact with WikiLeaks, he hadn't been colluding with him directly. They just had a friend in common. And yeah. Stone claimed that that friend was Randy Credico. Now, <laughs> which again is the exact same thing he did when he got caught the last time he did something it's super like shady. It's like Pulp Fiction, the way these characters come back around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Stone testified to the House Intelligence Committee in 2017 that uh, this was the case, and the recent indictment handed down by Bob Mueller makes it clear that this was yet another lie. Stone was charged with witness tampering for telling Critico things like, Stone wallet, plead the fifth, anything to save the plan. Yeah. That's a Richard Nixon quote, by the yeah. way. So when, you know, basically Stone lies and says that Credico is his source to WikiLeaks, and he's telling Credico, keep this lie going when you get in front of the, the, the House Intelligence Committee. And his way to tell him to commit this federal crime is to send him a, quote, 
of Nixon telling someone to commit a federal crime. That was yeah. one of the things that Nixon got caught doing and is why he got impeached. It's really funny because he also always says history is prologue. Yeah. Is Shakespeare Past quote is from, prologue. Yeah. Past is prologue. Yeah. And, and in The Tempest, in the Shakespeare speech, when the guy was saying, the character was saying that, I don't remember the character, but when he was saying that, it was a way to excuse murder. Mm -hmm. This freaking guy, like his code words are like, so easy to decipher. Yeah, his co word in this is literally another guy committing the same Ex crime he's exa committing. Exactly. <laughs> like, like, he's such a dummy. Roger, don't use that. Don't commit crimes yeah. through what's... I, I. This is a different jump that he's made, though, than the past. Yeah, and this is a lot dumber yeah. than the past. Yeah. Uh, he also said things like, if you turned over anything to the FBI, you're a fool. Uh, he threatened Credico's service dog, Bianca, saying he would take that dog away from you. You are a rat, a stoolie. You backstab your friends. Run your mouth. My lawyers are dying to rip you to shreds. I'm so ready. Let's get it on. Prepare to die. Expletive. Now, yeah. it's worth noting that uh, when questioned about this by Mother Jones, Roger Stone stated that his words were being taken out of context. And when he'd said, prepare to die, motherfucker, he had meant that you know, Credico was dealing with cancer. <laughs> so he's just Shh. saying, like, these are just really bad lies, Roger. So he says something that's even worse. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't mean I'm going to kill him. I mean, I mean you guys going to kill him. Yeah. And I'm going to remind him of that because yeah. I'm a prick. But I'll take his dog. Like, Jesus. Roger. It's so funny, too, because at first I went, oh, okay, this guy doesn't even like animals. He's a, he's a dick. And then the very next week when the FBI raided his home, yeah. he's like, they upset my wife. They upset my dogs. He's apparently a dog lover, <laughs> which, you know, a lot of people are. Um, he didn't say, I'll kill your dog. So maybe he was just threatening to That's abduct a man's service animal. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> like, you know what's different now is the old campaign was, I'll lie by any means necessary. Yeah. I'll do whatever I need to do to have this side of the country win. Now he's like, I don't care if it's another country yeah. that wants to As long him. as I don't get in trouble. As long as I don't get in trouble. So before uh, it was like, I'll have the conservative side versus the liberal side. Now it's like, I'll have an enemy of the nation. Yeah. This guy's a, he's gone from from a corrupt person to a traitor. Yeah. And and to a traitor who like in the months leading up to this on Infowars would regularly urge President Trump to essentially assume dictatorial powers and yeah. shut down the FBI investigation exactly. and stuff and it's like that's a line, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> that's and, a and it real... answers the question for a lot of people that are like, for an outsider, Trump really knows how to play the game. No. Trump doesn't know how to play the game. He just knows how to find shady people in sunny yep. places who know how to play the game. He knows when to listen. And when you're in real estate, nobody cares because everyone yeah. in the real estate business is a criminal. Exactly. Um, and it's fine. We're fine with that for some reason. Uh, not my not realtor sure in why. Long Beach, Susie. <laughs> Thanks, Susie. Sorry for drawing a mustache on your memo notepad that I got for free. She's strangling a dog right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, real estate agents. Uh, hit us up on Twitter, real estate agents. Uh, tell us about your favorite crimes that you've committed. You're all Nazis. <laughs> You're all Nazis. All real estate agents are Nazis. That is the stance of this podcast. Now, uh, enough of the claims Roger Stone made before Congress were proven false that he has been charged with at least five counts of making false statements during his testimony. And this is, in fact, other than witness tampering, like this, that's all of the indictments so far yeah. have been like you lied and you threatened somebody who was going out like a, a federal witness, yeah. which you can't do. Now, it appears that the main downfall for Roger Stone that got him busted by the FBI was his unjustified trust in the program WhatsApp. Here's a quote from Ars Technica. <laughs> That's great. Quote, he believed that WhatsApp, which he used as a secure phone line and for messaging, would protect his communications from the eyes of investigators, forgetting that the people he was talking to could just show the messages to Mueller's team in a grand jury. <laughs> he also left an email trail of his alleged misdeeds seemingly spanning a mile wide. After WikiLeaks released emails stolen from the Democratic National Committee on July 22, 2016, quote, a senior Trump campaign official was directed to contact Stone about any additional releases and what other damaging information WikiLeaks leaks had regarding the Clinton campaign, the indictment states. In return, Stone reached out to multiple associates in an attempt to communicate with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and obtain further Clinton-related emails. On July 25th, 2016, Stone emailed Corsi. The subject line was Get to Julian Assange. The message read Get to Julian Assange at Ecuadorian Embassy in London and get the pending WikiLeaks emails. They deal with foundation, allegedly. Really, don't leave 
text evidence of your crimes yeah. everywhere, Roger. I'm glad he did, though. And then threaten the people who you have an equal copy of all of the evidence of your crimes. Don't do that. You know, when I was a kid once, I, I killed a cockroach and I left his body there for the other cockroaches to see. Yeah. And that's what I want him to be. Yeah. I want him to be that cockroach. I want him to be a cautionary tale. I'm glad he's getting caught. I want him and Manafort. I want a lot of cockroaches yeah. strung up on a lot of walls. Because I'm worried about the, what they're inspiring. You know what I mean? The, that's the people why they've got to get... And th- that's why whenever people... It's the same reason like whenever people are like some 96-year-old Nazi gets found out and they're like trying to extradite him to Germany and people are like, well, he's 96. I'm like, no, yeah. take him to court. Yeah, Let him die on a plane. Make 100%. it Make it miserable. Yes. Make everyone else know this is what happens when you do crimes exactly. like this. Like, we'll exactly. get you eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Now... This is the point at which I think we finally get an answer to the running question for this whole episode. Is Roger Stone actually a political mastermind and evil genius, or did he just associate himself with a successful people and do a good job of hyping up his BS contributions? His behavior in 2018 was definitely the behavior of a cornered man growing increasingly panicked about coming legal smackdowns. His appearances on InfoWars grew more common. He would regularly attack the Mueller investigation as being part of a deep state cabal and frequently begged President Trump to make use of extreme examples executive powers to fire Rod Rosenstein and shut the whole thing down. It also seems, to me at least, that Stone's rhetoric grew more apocalyptic as the noose tightened. Here's a clip from him in late 2018. You will have a spasm of violence in this country, an insurrection like you've never seen. You think? No question. You think if you got impeached, like the, the, the country Both would go Both sides down? are heavily armed, my friend. Yes, absolutely. The, uh, this is not 1974. They, the, the people will not stand for impeachment. A politician who votes for it would be endangering their own life. There will be violence on both sides. Yeah. He's threatening people. He's threatening an apocalyptic civil war. Yeah. <laughs> and saying any politician who voted yeah. for it would have their lives threatened. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's... He's sending... Those are dog whistle messages he's yeah. sending to people. Threats. It's, yeah. Those are threats. It's not even... It's a fucking pig's ear thrown right at like a bunch of... I don't know how to finish that analogy, but you get my point. <laughs> Most of Stone's media appearances over the last year seem to have been a way for him to advertise his GoFundMe Legal Defense Fund. This fund has raised, so far, about $78,000 in the month it's been up. Michael Caputo, a former Trump campaign advisor and friend of Roger Stone, actually started the campaign. He claims that Stone has lost everything in the ongoing legal battle. Politico noted that, the month before, Stone posted an Instagram picture of himself on a beach, smoking a cigar, and wearing designer sunglasses. So, probably a lie, like everything else Roger Stone has ever said. One group, at least, has stuck with Roger Stone in the wake of his indictment and arrest. The Proud Boys. Stone started using them as his personal security for events in 2017 and eventually went through what they call their first degree initiation. He chose Cinco de Mayo as the date to do this. And their whole initiation is around like claiming that like, I'm not going to apologize for creating the world as a Western man. I don't know. I don't think it's a coincidence that he picked Cinco de Mayo. I think they're just anything they can do to be a little bit more racist. Just It's really funny because even even the idea of a white race is a lie. Yeah. There is no white race. It was a construct. No. It's no such thing. Hang out with a Russian, hang out with an Irishman. It's not the same thing. And the the Proud Boys are a little smarter than talking about the white race. They claim Mm. Western civilization. That's their (laughs) catch-all because then you don't have to all be – White, but you can still essentially stand well, for white supremacy. The, then embrace your Middle Eastern side, because that's what Iran is. Iran yeah. is supposed to be the birthplace of the real white people. That's why it sounds like Aryan. It's Iran. Yeah. So fun. so get your white loafers out and your Capri 100s Yeah. and start calling people my friend if you really want to be the origin of white. Oh, man. And get way better at cooking <laughs> lamb. Way better at cooking lamb. Yeah. We cannot cook a goddamn <laughs> lamb in this country to save our lives. It's just, it's a trick. It's all a trick. It, it's when a powerful white man tells a poor white man that he's just like him, it's hypnotizing. Well, that's exactly what Roger Stone talks about in the, as a young man, being like, I'm going to be the bridge between working class wow. white people and rich white people. That makes sense. That's exactly what wow. he, he's always been about. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, he would like the Proud Boys. One prominent Proud Boy is currently selling Roger Stone Did Nothing Wrong t-shirts. Uh, <laughs> when he was arraigned last Monday, several Proud Boys provided an escort and chanted their vocal support of the man. We haven't talked much about Roger Stone's style obsession in this podcast. Yeah. I just it, – it, it's not really funny. Like I read a bunch of what he wrote. It's just like 
pretentious stuff for people who care about suits and whatnot, which if that's your thing, that's fine. That's sure. Everybody's got to have a thing. Yeah. Um, but there is a way in which that became a source of some schadenfreude for me. Starting, I think, in the 1990s, Stone became increasingly enamored with ostentatious outfits, generally dressing like someone who lives to fight Batman. He became the Daily Caller's men's style correspondent and also writes a 10 best and worst dress list every year. In most of these columns, Stone's header image is a picture of himself dressed as and wielding a gun like James Bond. He clearly views himself as a slick, badass political operator and wants others to see him that way too. That reputation has been punctured by a long series of dumb mistakes, many of them in his appearances on Infowars. Mistakes like claiming exiled Chinese businessman Guo Wenggui had been convicted of financial crimes and donated illegally to Hillary Clinton and Steve Bannon. None of this was true. Stone and Infowars were sued for $100 million, and last year Roger Stone was forced to make an on-air public apology for having failed to do proper research. He's almost 70. Yeah. That's what I keep reminding myself. Yeah. The way he behaves. Yeah. He's a grandfather. He is a grandfather. He's almost 70, and this is how he acts. This is how he behaves. This is the philosophy he has, that he's a a spy and a badass and uses all this tough guy language. And really, he's the one who sees himself naked and weak and his bones getting softer and his muscles starting to sag. Mm -hmm. He, He can't beat time. No, nobody can. Nobody can. Oh, it makes me so well, angry. Well, Patrick Stewart. But <laughs> other than Patrick you Stewart, know what? nobody he can had, beat time. He, he's really right. nailed time. <laughs> Hate may be a greater motivator, but love makes your skin look better when you yeah, get older. Yeah. Oh, man, he looks so good. He looks great. Yeah, yeah. Now, despite all of Roger Stone's claims to being a sly, badass, brilliant Nixonian-style political operator, Roger Stone has proven to just be a bad criminal who got lucky for a while. He's yeah. not a badass. He's just bad. In the wake of his indictment, Roger Stone has whined incessantly about having roughly as much force used against him in his apprehension as a small-time pot dealer in Texas. Stone complained that he wasn't called ahead of time to give him a chance to dress up and look his best for the cameras. (laughs) Instead, he was photographed in a simple blue polo shirt. When he was released later that day, he had to give his press conference looking like a normal, elderly man and not the penguin. It is a moment of great schadenfreude for me, and we are going to end the episode by playing the clip of his press conference after being arrested. I love it. Define Schadenfreude. What's Schadenfreude? Taking pleasure in the misfortune of others. I like it's a that. German oh, word. Oh, I yeah. like that word. Yeah, it's a great word. Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Congratulations, Roger. Congratulations. Got you, Roger. Thank you. Stand with you, Roger. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. As I have always said, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Uh, after a two-year inquisition, the charges today relate in no way to Russian collusion, WikiLeaks collaboration, or any other illegal act in connection with the 2016 campaign. I am falsely accused of making false statements during my testimony to the House Intelligence Committee. That is incorrect. Any uh, any error I made in my testimony would be both immaterial and without intent. Uh, I th- All right. I want that on my iTunes. Yeah, it's it, it feels good, right? It feels good. It's it like does. a little squeegee for your soul That's after so, all this. It makes me believe in God mm-hmm. and Santa Claus. Lock him up Lock indeed. Lock him up sounds, mm. oh, it's so nice. Mm. Oh, it's like a pizza after smoking weed. Yeah. Oh, it's so satisfying. I'm not normally a big fan of chanting as part of a crowd, but <laughs> that would right. have been a fun crowd to chant as part of. And believe me, as an Arab in America, <laughs> the only time the only time I like people chanting USA, USA, USA yeah. is during the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Outside of that, I'm like, get but away from chanting, me. chanting, lock him up at Roger Stone. Mm. Man. Mm-mm-mm. Oh, that's so good. Just. It's like Oof. emotional bubble wrap. I just wanna, oh, so just pleasing. Just want to eat it all. Yeah, man. Guzzle that down. Give me the bread to sop up the sauce. Yeah. Yeah, that <laughs> tastes good. That tastes good at the end of this this gross tale. So, Schadenfreude. 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 Uh, it, yeah, taking pleasure, pleasure in the misfortune of others. It's I like that. great German words. It's a great word. Yeah, they're, they're really great at making single words for things. Although this is like the joy of seeing justice. Yeah, it is you a know? little bit... Like it, this is justified. The beginning of it, yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah, it's the start yeah. of a process of justice that hopefully leads to him dying in a cell. Yeah, I'm a big believer in rehabilitation, but if you're 70 and doing the shit Roger Stone's been doing for the last couple of years, I couldn't agree more. You're probably man. not going to get rehabbed. I, I absolutely just agree. Be not allowed in society anymore. Yeah. 
Same thing with Paul Manafort, you know? If you're if your crime is selling drugs or even beating someone, even even accidentally killing an individual, even killing someone in in the uh, in the throes of a sudden rage, I believe in some sort of like rehabilitation for yeah. you. But if your crime is conspiring to thwart the liberty of yeah. millions of people around the world, I don't believe in rehabilitating that. Hundred percent agree. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's a crazy thing to see someone who came that way. Like, I, you know, I, I came from a dad that was abusive and mm-hmm. he had PTSD from war and I had a drinking problem he had everything against him. But I could always look back and say, I, I understand the dynamics of abuse. I understand that he was abused too. Yeah. And then the guy that bit him was like a vampire. And then I had to go to therapy so I could be like one of the vampires on Twilight. Like there was a, sure. there was a cause, there was an origin. And purpose. that's why you're great at baseball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But with him, you just look at this and- I still, at the end of it, even if there's satisfaction, I just go, why? Yeah, it's a sad story. Yeah. As it usually is with these guys. Yeah. Yeah, and there's really, like, it's a man who I don't think ever had anything at the center of himself that he was proud of. So he was proud of his ability to do things for other people he yeah. admired. Whether or not at first people who didn't know him, like when he's he's lying about Nixon to, so that he can get you know his class to vote for JFK, and then he he gradually gets like the first one of these guys that he works for that he gets anywhere close to Richard Nixon. He just loves the rest of his life, yeah. Because Nixon spent time with him, like he wasn't a part of Nixon's staff, but they like hung out together and stuff. And so I, th- I really do. You see, he doesn't say a lot about it other than like fawning praise for Nixon, but you see pictures of Nixon and Roger Stone, and he very much has that doting son look. In his 100%. Eyes. And even the, his office is like yeah. a like a um, a shrine. A shrine to, to exa- Richard Nixon. To Nixon. It's so crazy. It would even be one thing like a guy like LBJ who like killed a lot of people in Vietnam, but you could also be like, well, but then there's the Civil Rights Act and like yeah. I can see how someone could like even with this guy's really problematic legacy, I could see how someone who worked for him could be still loyal to that memory. Nixon <laughs> like- and and some of the stuff <laughs> And some of the stuff he kept was like neg anti Nixon stuff yeah. that shows that he just doesn't care about he just good likes or bad. The way Nixon he wants was attention. talked about, yeah, he yeah. just wants attention. Because again, his parents were never around. Exactly. I don't know. There's always the thin line in this show between trying to give a detailed history of these people and sure. psychoanalyzing them. Sure, of course. You can't avoid it entirely, though. When you read quotes like how Roger describes his childhood, and then just see what his adult life is. Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, his life couldn't have been easy. He was a child with doll hair. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is sad. A child bodybuilder with a Nixon tattoo. Child bodybuilder with a Nixon tattoo. <laughs> uh, I just imagine a shrunk version of him. That's it. He's always been that guy. He was uh, always had that tattoo on his back, <laughs> even when he was breastfeeding. You know, one of the great forever untold stories of history will be the sheer impact and damage that insecure male egos have had oh, in our society, 100%. even in places where you wouldn't expect it. You wouldn't expect Dwight D. Eisenhower didn't give off a lot of impulses of being an insecure man yeah. but then you see what he was doodling when we overthrew guatemala when he heard that like he'd successfully instituted a coup in this country yeah. and he drew a picture of himself young and swole yep. like muscular next to a battleship flexing and it's yeah. like yeah dude you had some issues that's not normal that's I mean, weird dude our <laughs> like, whole lives we hear how how hard it is for women that they lose their beauty but we don't talk about fading power yeah. You know, like I grew up in a really rough neighborhood and I used to be a scary looking guy and I'm ta- sleeved in tattoos, but I'm a nicer person now. And I go to, go to therapy. The, but the one thing I miss is when I walk down the street that people move away from me. Because you're and like, you're big and muscular yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And there's something about that. As much as I hated who I was back then, I miss that feeling. Yeah. Of and being a human pit bull. There's not a lot of training in our society for young men to get used to the fact that they will someday not have the kind of physical power they have. This is something yeah. I really admired my grandpa for. My grandpa was a really big guy, six foot five, six foot six, something wow. like that. And he was he was military most of his life, yeah. fought in Korea, uh, was like a very big, very imposing man. But the last 10 or 15 years of his life, he was just completely debilitated with Parkinson's, wow. couldn't really move. But I never got, never, ever, ever, of all the of the emotions that I saw from him, none of them was anger. None of them was like lashing out at people over the fact that I could tell he was frustrated, obviously, not being able to control his body anymore. Um, And I don't think 
a guy like Roger Stone or a guy like Dwight D. Eisenhower or whatever. I don't think I don't think they got that at any point. That yeah. attitude of like, okay, you are going to be able to control the world around you less as you get older because that's just life, and that's why we have society and civilization. We all work together to take care of each other because exactly. when we get weaker, we need more help. You know? Yeah. They don't get that, and yeah. that's where libertarians come there's from. Dangerous, <laughs> there's dangerous language in our society. This, they, I, a friend of mine reminded me the other night, like, boys don't cry is a phrase that turns us into men that don't talk. It's like women grow up with impossible physical standards, but really men grow up with impossible emotional ones. Yeah. And when something bad happens to a little boy, if he's not able to talk, can he turn into something evil and dark and twisted and upside down? Yeah, if the alternative, which is admitting like weakness and uh, and pain and a need for help, if that is literally unthinkable because of the society he's been raised in, like, yeah, yeah what else does he do but like get violent? Yeah. Yeah. This is like a worldwide problem. Uh, I agree. Obviously. I like, agree 100%. I yeah. went to college in Sweden and I saw a movie there. It was Judge Dredd. And oh, I, shit. I, yeah. The original. The original. Okay. The good and one. I was yeah. going to college. So was, class wasn't starting for three weeks. So we went to see Judge Dredd and it was rated X. And I was like, oh, oh shit, Stallone's right. making porn. So then I wasn't going to watch it, but a bunch of people were going in. I'm like, screw it. I'll go in. I go in regular movie. Two weeks later, I see a movie with a Swedish friend, a Swedish movie, rated PG, and his nephew's next to us, and a guy pulls down his pants and his penis is out there, and he's shaking it around, and, and I'm in shock, and the yeah. little kid's just eating Swedish, fi- Swedish fish, you yeah. know? Yeah, it's just a penis. Just a penis. Whatever. And then my yeah. friend goes, oh, I forgot you're from America. Yeah. You guys rate your movies by sex. We rate our movies by violence. Yeah. And I just felt like a monkey. No, it's... <sighs> it makes more sense. Yeah, it really does. And there's a lot of... I mean, we could, we could, we could go down this rabbit hole for forever. Yeah, we're, sorry. we're well yeah. off. No, I mean, don't <laughs> yeah. apologize because it's I, it's a subject that's never not interesting to me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the difference between uh, as a little kid. I I started shooting guns when I was six or seven. My uncle came over and he taught me how to shoot, and we 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 did some hunting and stuff like that. And I don't think that's unhealthy, but I think playing with guns the way I played with guns as a little kid was unhealthy. I think Mm. that's bad for you. I think that like fetishization of violence and power and then coming into a world. And I think there's this, I think video games give it to you too, where you get used to in this one little aspect of your life, this fantasy aspect, having all this control and being able to be the arbiter of who lives and dies and all this stuff. And then you go into the real world where you have none of that control because it's the world and there's other people doing their own things and you can't just be, I think that's where the alt right comes from is that like dichotomy that like mental disconnect i think you're right i think people masturbate to the alt-right the way people who don't have sex masturbate to porn stars yeah they're behaving in a way and doing things that i can't do but i wish i can yeah yeah it's that that's why these guys focus on nazis or whatever who just got rid of all the people they don't like because all these little kids in their rooms just have a bunch of hate for people who won't go away the way their enemies in a video game will yeah and I guess that's why Roger Stone embraced the Proud Boys and the alt right so definitively, because at the end of the day, he didn't have video games to grow up with, but <laughs> he is that guy. He definitely He is, is that guy wearing fancy suits and calling his suspenders braces so that he can be better <laughs> than everybody and control his world more. We brought it back around. It was great. We well brought done. it back around. You're, not, you're a poet. Uh, to me, you want to plug your pluggables? Sure. Uh, if you're looking for live comedy with a political bent... You can find all my live shows in and around L.A. and around the country at TamerKatan.com, T-A-M-E-R-K-A-T-T-A-N. Um, my podcast is They Tried to Bury Us. Um, every week we have a new American origin story from a different immigrant. And I'm Tamer Cat on all things social media. And you can find me on uh, the twits, the tweet at I write OK. That's me on the on the twarts. And uh, you can find this podcast on the internet at BehindTheBastards.com. You can find us on the social meds at at BastardsPod. You can buy a shirt. You can buy a cup. Very cool shirts, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Very great shirts. You can buy uh, scale models of the spaceship from Aliens, all from TeePublic.com, all branded with our Don't Tell James Cameron that. Uh, It's very illegal. But uh, for a limited time until we get a takedown request, we will be selling all of that stuff. James Cameron has sex in bikinis. Really? Well, Roger Stone said it. Oh, well, I mean, then it's got to be true. It's got to be true. Well, let's all leave you guys on that on that absolutely true note from uh, from our buddy Roger Stone. 